While the storm howls above me And there's no hiding place Meet the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe till the storm passes by boys and girls and welcome to story time let us please pray 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come and spend in your presence. We pray, Lord, for each family out there in, here in South Africa and around the world. Father, we know that we are going through very tough times with the COVID epidemic, but we pray, Lord, that you will give us all peace and understanding and most of all lord you said suffer little children unto me and we pray this morning for each child lord that you will be with them during this time in jesus name amen vandag se story is oor 'n tuinier wat vir 'n ryk vrou gewerk het ou jan het vir mevrou gewerk vir baie baie jare hy het na haar tuin gesien hy het na haar blomme gesien Hy het geskoffel hier en hy het gehard daar so en haar tuin was altyd prachtig, prachtig mooi. Een dag sê my vrou vir hom, Jan, jy moet bykie vandag by my kom thee drink. O Jan het gewonder, wat gaan aan? Want my vrou het nooit vir hom gevra om thee te kom drink nie, maar hy het huis toe gegaan, hy het sy prachtige kleren aangesit, hy het sy gezicht gewas en sy hande mooi gewas en gewas. Toe is hy na mevrou sy huis toe en hy klop aan die deur. Mevrou maak oop en hy sê vir hom, welkom, welkom Jan, kom binnen, ek het vir jou een verrassing. Toe hy by die sitkamer inloop, sê mevrou vir hom, sit asjeblief. En toe hy daar sit, skink sy vir hom een lekker koppie thee. En daar was koekies, koek op die tafel en alles. Hy het rechtig baie, baie belangrik gevoel. Toe sê sê vir hom, weet jy Jan, jy werk nou vir my vir baie, baie jare en jy het altyd my tuin so mooi gehou. Die mens in die dorp, hulle sê die tuin is te prachtig en het versier die dorp so mooi. En vandag het ek vir jou een geskenk. Jy is mos nou oud en jy het nergens om jy te gaan nie. Jy het nie eers familie nie. So ek gaan vir jou een stuk land gee waar jy een huisie kan bou en jou eie tuin kan maak. Man, dit was nou, het hom sommer stom gemaakt, want hy was so gelukkig, dat hy nou sy eie huisie en sy eie tuin gaan maak. Sy sê, nou kom jy saam met my, want jy gaat vir jou, jou stikkie land, gaat jy nou kies. En ou Jan klim in die landrover en daar gaat hy, saam met my vrou om sy land te kies. En hy kies die prachtigste stik land, en daar help my vrou om om my huisie op te sit, en hy begin sommer een tuinkie te maak daar vir om gras te sit en alles. Eendag vraag hy vir my vrou, kan hy asjeblief door toe gaan? My vrou sê vir my, ja, gaan Jan, en gaan kry die goed wat jy nou nodig het. En hy gaan toe door toe, en hy kry vir hom een graaf, hy kry vir hom een waterkanniekie, en hy kry vir hom tot een hark wat hy mee kan hark. En daar gaat hy terug na die ander winkel toe, die winkel waar blomme verkoop. En hy kyk na die blomme, en hy kyk na die blomme, en hy kan nie sy, hy kan nie op, hy kan nie sê wat die blomme hy wil heen nie. En die vroukie wees vir hom toe sade, sade in pakkies. En hy kyk die sade, en hy kyk die sade, en hy vat vir hom, en hy koop vir hom een pakkie sade, waar blomme baie verskillende blomme is. En hy gaan huis toe, en hy saai die blomme, en elke ochend, voordat hy werd toe gaan, dan water hy gegoed die blomme. En dit het aangegaan vir een week, twee weke, drie weke, toe sien hy syke klein groen stokkies uitkom, en hy weet toe, dat die sade nou begin groei. En elke week was die sade langer en langer, en die stemmiekies was langer en langer, en een ochend toe word hy wakker, toe sal knoppies op die oud stemmiekies, en hy raak toe opgewonde, wat nou wil hy sien wat sy blomme daar uitkom. En nog een twee weke, en hy word wakker, en daar sien hy die blommiekies. En dit was verskillende blommiekies gewees. Daar was pinkes, daar was geeles, daar was blauwes, daar was perses, daar was blommiekies wat groot was, blommiekies wat klein was, daar was verskrikkelijk baie blomme gewees in die tuin. En die punt van die story is, ons is blomme in Jesus' tuin. Dit maak nie saak hoe ons lyk nie, dit maak nie saak hoe ons hare is nie, wat ons kleer van ons velikies is nie, dit maak glad nie saak nie, want Jesus het ons gemaakt en ons is verskillende blommiekies 
in in sy tuin, en hy is baie, baie, baie lief vir amal. Thank you, Sister Irene, for that lovely story. We can all be flowers in God's kingdom one day. Imagine, we come from various families, and this month we are focusing more on the family. And as our mission statement for children's mission, ministry, we nurture children into a loving and serving relationship with God, and that is what family does. We don't have to be the same color. We don't have to be the same color hair or the same coloring we can all be different colors just like auntie irene and i are of different colors and boys and girls god loves us no matter what color we are we must learn that in our life we need to as families we sometimes the families we're in are not even our biological families but we thank god that we are in a family and not only are we just in a family we also belong to god's family i also belong to a family i belong to the seven day adventist church family as well and so do many of you and this morning we say thank you lord for the families that we belong in sometimes they're not our mothers that brought us into this world or our fathers and sometimes we get a little older and we go into these families but but we just want to say thank you lord that we have families today some of us live in orphanages and that's where we still become families and we're so thankful that god has given us the opportunity to breathe another day and to be able to nurture each other and to love each other and that is what god's family is all about that we love each other so that one day we can live it in eternity with God and also just like Auntie Arian spoke about the various types of flowers that grew in that garden of Uncle Yan, we are growing different colors and different personalities and different we all have our own ways God has made us all unique he wanted us all to be unique he didn't want us to be the same color he didn't want us to have the same personalities he wanted us to have different smiles and different voices and we even speak different languages some of us but we thank God that he loves us unconditionally whether we are talking Afrikaans or English or Zulu, he loves us unconditionally. And one day, if we really serve God, we'll be able to live with him in eternity. Sister Irene, won't you please pray? And we thank you, boys and girls, because we can pray together. And they say a family that prays together stays together. We can read our Bibles together. And Sister Irene is going to close now in prayer. And we thank you all for this opportunity that we could share each other and remember, love one another, especially during this time. Kom ons maak ons oogies toe. Dankie lieve Jesus vir die lieflike dag. Dankie lieve Jesus dat ons familie het. Dankie dat u ons bystaan en ons lief het. En ons vraag dat u saam met ons kan wees hier die week, dat ons ander mense kan aanvaar met, met wat hulle doen en hulle families aanvaar ook. Dankie lieve Jesus en ons het u baie lief. Amen. I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I trust that you are well. Uh, my name is Pastor Wayne Govender, and it is a great privilege for me to share the word of God with you. The book of Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Life has indeed become more burdensome since the pandemic. Uh, many have been and are currently going through challenges and trials like never before. Uh, these words of comfort in Matthew eleven twenty eight were spoken uh, to the great multitude of people that followed Jesus during his earthly ministry. He knew that many of them were weary. He knew that many of them were heavy laden. He knew that many of them were going through emotional and financial distress. And so in other words, they were carrying burdens that they could not bear. Uh, these words of comfort were not only directed at them, but is also an invitation for us. Uh, to trust God by laying our burdens at his feet. And as we do, the Bible says that we will indeed experience God's peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray, this, uh, I pray that we would uh, uh, be blessed today as we study God's word together. Um, the scripture reading for today comes to us from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through to verse 3. But before we read those words together, shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your love and your faithfulness. 
We pray that as we open your word that you would speak to us, that you, O oh Lord, would reveal yourself to us. And we pray that all that he said now will, bring, uh, uh, will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 says, And now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them from the presence of the Lord. Can a whale swallow a man? More importantly, if swallowed, will a man be able to survive inside the belly of this great fish? There are many people today from all walks of life who don't believe in this account or in this story of Jonah. They call it, they call it a fable because no one can be swallowed by a whale and come out alive. But in 1896, an article titled, A Modern Jonah Proves His Story, was published in the New York World, stating that in February of, 90, of 1891, a whaling ship called Star of the East was hunting whales in the South Atlantic Ocean. A whale was sighted and two boats were sent to kill it. One of the sailors on the boat managed to spear the whale. The whale, now injured, went below the surface of the water and came back up with such force that it capsized one of the boats. All but two, two crew members were rescued, while the others were presumed dead at sea. A few hours later, the whale was dead and was towed into the boat, and the crew began the task of cutting it up. And when they came to the stomach, they were shocked to see something moving around inside. They quickly cut the stomach open and found one of the missing sailors, 35-year-old James Bartley, inside alive but unconscious. He was soon revived. Back in England, Bartley was taken to a London hospital. His skin had been bleached and wrinkled to the appearance of all parchment due to the gastric juices found inside the whale's stomach. Although his skin never looked the same again, he did enjoy fairly good health. He died, he died 18 years later, and on his tombstone it reads, James Bartley, Modern Day Jonah. Although the story has been questioned over the years concerning its veracity, the story of Jonah is factual, as the events did transpire based on what Jesus said in the book of Matthew 12:40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The story of Jonah begins this way. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. It's amazing how just one sentence can change your life. You can be driving on the freeway or driving down the road and you get one phone call that changes your life forever. If it's good news, your life changes for the better. If it's bad news, your life changes for the worse. Either way, our lives can be turned upside down with just one phone call. Life can change in just a few seconds. And that's what happened to Jonah when God spoke these three words to him, go to Nineveh. And note what Jonah was to do. Jonah was to go to Nineveh and preach against it. This is not a message of, God's, of, of God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He, he, Jonah was commissioned to go to Nineveh and preach against it. Their evil, their wickedness was like a dirty stench in the eyes of God. And God could bear it no longer. The time of judgment for the city of Nineveh had come. Jonah is the missionary who is reluctant is, he is one who is withdrawn, one who is stubborn, never quite ready to go to Nineveh. All throughout the Bible, people are getting up and going. I, we, we recall that Abraham and Sarah move out on a promise and a prayer. Moses heads for Egypt with nothing but a shepherd's staff. Elijah stands defiant, facing 450 prophets of Baal, but not Jonah. 
Jonah stands on the dock with tickets for Tashish. All over the New Testament, people are getting up and following Jesus. Fishermen are dropping their nets. Tax collectors are leaving their old lives of cheating and overcharging. And others are forsaking everything to follow Jesus. The apostles travel the world spreading God's love of, of grace and mercy. But not Jonah. Jonah stands on the dock with tickets to Tashish. And today the spirit of Jonah lingers amongst us. Perhaps within our families, perhaps within our churches, within our society. This spirit of inactivity, this spirit of dormancy, this spirit of disobedience has seized the minds of many. When we consider this account of Jonah, we notice that God's call to him was a very personal call. He says to him, Jonah, son of Amittai. It was God's plan for Jonah to go to Nineveh. God knows us. He knows our talents. He knows our capabilities. And it is a wonderful day in our lives when we come to realize just what God has in mind for us on a personal level. And it is an even better day when we decide to accept his will and plan for our lives. The book of Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us, when the prophet says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Not only was God's call personal, but God's call was specific. His, his assignment was to go to the city of Nineveh. According to Genesis 10, 11, Nineveh was founded by the notorious Nimrod. And being the capital of Assyria, it was the wickedest city in the world being located on the Tigris River in what is today known as modern Iraq. The book of Nahum chapter 3 describes, this, uh, describes the spiritual condition of the people of Nineveh. And so it says that as you travel, to the, uh, to, as you tra travel through the city, you will, see, you, will, you will see piles of corpses. You will see bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, harlots, sorcery, prostitution, the people of Nineveh were fierce, they were cruel. In Nineveh, they burnt their children alive. They tortured adults by skinning them alive and leaving them to die in the hot burning sun. The Assyrians had a reputation for cruelty that is hard for us to fathom. The more Jonah thought about it, the more he knew that Nineveh was a good place to stay away from. And yet God was calling Jonah to Nineveh. But Nineveh was not on Jonah's preaching schedule. This was one place that he did not want to go. Not only was God's call personal, not, not only was God's call specific, but God's call also had a great purpose. Jonah was to go and preach against the city. And so Jonah was not to go to the city of his choice. He was not to preach philosophy or pious platitudes. He was not to set up a van ministry or coal pot to work. These are good and serve a purpose. But Jonah in this context was called to go to the very seat of sin and preach against their wicked ways. But he refused to do what God had commissioned. Don't run to Tashish when you have responsibilities in Nineveh. And so what qualifies as Nineveh today? Nineveh is whatever pulls you out of your comfort zone. Nineveh is the place that God calls you where you don't want to go. Nineveh is the people who have hurt you deeply. And God says, go and give them my message of forgiveness. Forgive them. Reconcile. Nineveh is danger. Nineveh is discomfort. Nineveh is whatever you hate that God loves deeply. Nineveh is perhaps your spouse whom you once loved deeply, but now find it difficult to get along. Nineveh is your family who needs you in the midst of your busyness. Nineveh is the world around us that needs to hear the glad tidings that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, and Jesus delivers. Jonah 1 verse 3 says that Jonah decided uh, to board a ship that was on its way to Tarshish. And so the Bible says he found a ship bound for Tarshish. God told Jonah to go east, but Jonah said, Lord, I'm going west. And so when Jonah found the ship, he must have said to himself, what a coincidence. This is good luck. Luck is with me. 
And so do we ever justify our choices by the way things just seem to fall into place? And so, friends, you also may find a ship ready and waiting for you. It's a marvel that Satan always has a ship waiting for those who are willing to run away from God. But if you are en route to Tarshish, when God has called you to Nineveh, if you have decided to go somewhere else, when God has clearly spoken of what you need to do and to where and to whom you should go, you can be sure that a great storm is brewing. And sooner or later, you will go overboard and your life will be in jeopardy. And so here is how it works today. A wife may be having trouble in a marriage. And just when things are not looking too good, suddenly along comes another man who seems to be so kind. He seems to be so understanding. And he becomes the ship for Tashish. And so if she leaves her husband just because she finds another ship waiting, I can assure you that she will live the rest of her life being miserable and, and unhappy. If a young Christian girl marries an unsaved man just because he happened to be there waiting, she is like Jonah. She thinks that all will be well after the wedding, but a storm is coming and soon a happiness and joy will go overboard. You see, Satan always sees that transportation is provided for those who are running away from God's will, and he will make sure that that ship sails right on time. How many times do we buy a ticket to Tashish to try and get away from God, from church, from religion, from doing what God wants us to do? Every wrong word, every forbidden thought and action, unfaithfulness to principle and responsibility, intemperance, going to unholy places or spending time in frivolous entertainment are all tickets to Tashish. The world is standing in line for their tickets. The question is, are we standing in line as well? Most people today say that it seems like everything that is fun is sin. Today, as can be seen all over the world, people find pleasure in gratifying the carnal nature. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are all detrimental to one's spiritual maturity. But the Word of God tells us that true joy and contentment can only be found in the presence of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 16, 11, In your presence is fullness of joy. I don't know about you, but fullness of joy sounds good to me. It is a lie from Satan to believe that sin is fun and godliness is boring. The truth about sin is that it is deceptive, it is, de it is destructive, and it is deadly. Sin will take us further than we want to go because the truth about sin is that sin will hurt. And so not only will sin take us further than we want to go, but sin will keep us longer than we want to stay. On one occasion when David's army was out fighting battles for him, we are told that he was at home alone and he arose from his bed and walked around the rooftop. And as he walked around, he saw Bathsheba and he committed adultery with her. I'm sure that when David first looked from his rooftop and, and saw Bathsheba that evening, he never planned to commit adultery with her, but he didn't stop to realize that sin will take you further than you want to go. David commits adultery, Bathsheba gets pregnant, and then David tries by trickery to have her husband brought back from the battlefield to spend some time with his wife to make it appear as if the baby is Uriah's. But when this plan fails, he arranges for Uriah to be killed. And so not only did sin take David further than he wanted to go, but sin uh, kept him longer than he wanted to stay. And look at what it cost David. He became an adulterer. He became a murderer. The baby that was born to him and Bathsheba died. God pronounced that the sword would not depart from the house of David and that turmoil would be constantly there. And so we read that Amnon, his son, rapes his half-sister. Absalom, his other son, double-crosses his father and tries to take the throne from him. You start adding it up and you will find that David paid a tremendous cost for his one night of sin. Sin will cost you more than you are willing 
to pay. Notice with me Jonah's downward fall. First, the Bible says he went down to Joppa, then he went down into the ship, then down into the sea, then down into the whale's belly, then down into the deep. Jonah was in the very bottom of the barrel. This downward spiral was not a coincidence. It's a statement of what happens when we stray away or when we disobey God's will for our lives. Anytime we run away from God, we never go up. We always go down. When we decide to disobey God, there is always a boat going to Tashish. And there is always room for one more passenger. Jonah paid the fare and it was a very expensive cost to him. Sin is costly. Sin is the most expensive thing in the old world for it cost Jesus his life. The book of Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. You can see how expensive sin is every day. Ask the prodigal son standing there in the hog mud, handing out the husk about the cost of leaving God. You get some idea of how expensive sin is when you see the worn down face of men and women on the street who are paying the fare. Many are hooked on the bottle. Others are hooked on crime. The way of the transgressor is tough. Each one is some mother's son. Some are fathers and grandfathers. They are shadows of the men they might have been. And yet they stand there on the street, all because they have paid the fare to Tashish. So far, Jonah's plan has worked to perfection. But God is not through with Jonah just yet. He's just getting started. The Bible tells us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it will lead to destruction. In the book of Jonah, chapter 1, 4 and 5, it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. It is hard to comprehend how he could sleep while the storm was raging. He was in a deep sleep. He was slumbering during a crisis hour. He was at ease while the ship was about to sink. And so when men or women leave God, this usually happens. It takes something powerful to wake us up when we are deep in spiritual sleep. God will sometimes have to allow trouble to come and shake some sense into us. He would much prefer for us never to go through the storms of life. But sometimes that's the only way to get our attention. And so it shows how insensitive we can become. Because the Bible says that sin hardens the heart. Ephesians 4.12 says, They have lost all sensitivity so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Another version says or uses the word callous. It says they have become calloused. A callous is just skin that has lost its sensitivity. If you lose your calluses, you will have tender feet or tender hands. Sin makes us spiritually insensitive. Our heart becomes hardened when we live a life of sin. And thus, we cannot respond to the call of God in our lives. This storm not only served the purpose of waking Jonah from spiritual sleep, but we are told that the storm also exposed his character. The captain of the ship finally found him, shook him awake and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. When the waves of death were beating against his ship, suddenly the captain believed in prayer. Jonah was hiding his true identity. We can hide behind our wealth. We can hide behind our status. We can hide behind our prestige and education. But sooner rather than later, our true character, our true identity will be revealed. Numbers 32.23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. We do untold harm to Jesus when we claim to be Christians and do not live like it. Then the captain said to Jonah, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Then the men of the ship were exceedingly afraid, for the men knew that Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord. And so praise God for that storm. 
It was a sign that God was not through with Jonah just yet. If you are running away from God, your experience will be similar to Jonah's. Your trip will be an unhappy one. God will follow you. God will pursue you. A loving God will chase you down. He will find you in the bottom of life and he will pick you up with his soft, gentle hands. Jonah had lost his testimony. It is a sorry day when a Christian has to be asked, what is your occupation? If someone has been around us for a long period of time and they have to ask us if we are Christians, then, then we have simply lost our connection, our relationship with Christ. And so look at all the questions they asked Jonah. How can you sleep? Who is responsible? What do you do? Where do you come from? And why are you not praying? He was on trial for being a Christian and there was no evidence. Do the people that you work with know that you belong to Christ? Do the people that you go to school with know that there is a creator? Do the people that you socialize with know and can they see Christ in and through you? Jonah made a statement about himself. He said, I fear the Lord, the God of the heavens. He said, I worship the Lord. But Jonah did not really fear or worship God. Because if he did, he would have been en route to Nineveh. Jonah was deceived about his Christian experience. His practice did not match his profession. He used to be a follower of Christ. But that was now in the past. You see, you can't be saved on past experiences. Our walk with Jesus must be fresh and new every day. Christianity is like the manna that used to fall from heaven. You could not keep it very long. It had to be constantly renewed. This is why the Apostle Paul says, I need to die daily. Our, our, our relationship with Christ needs to be renewed every day. The book of Jonah 1.11 says, Then they said to Jonah, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. It is rare that a convicted criminal recommends a sentence that is stronger than the judge and jury decide upon. But this is the case of Jonah. When the sailors asked Jonah, what they should do that the storm would spare them he said cast me overboard as far as they were concerned and also jonah this meant the death sentence however they put great effort into trying to save jonah for in verse 13 we read nevertheless the men rode hard as hard as the sailors worked to spare the life of jonah Jonah's message to them was that one would have to die, that others might be spared. All their works were not going to save them. This reminds us of the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The Apostle Paul says that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, and that salvation is simply a gift from the hand of God. Jonah had endangered the very lives of others by being out of God's will. The storm was his fault. And so young people, old people, think about your lives. If you are not following God's will, what example are you setting for others? Your spiritual apathy endangers the lives of those around you. Innocent people on that ship suffered because of Jonah's sin. As we stand back and as we look in at the story, a question naturally arises. How far? Will God let us go in our sin? Why doesn't God stop us sooner? And so my response would be that part of God's judgment is not to stop us. You see, God could have arranged things so the ship went to a different port. God could have so arranged things that the ship had no room for Jonah. God could so have arranged things so a thief robbed Jonah of his money and thus he would have had mo no money to pay the fare. Sometimes the judgment of God is simply that God lets us go on and on in our sin so that we realize the folly of our decisions when we come face to face with the consequences of our choices. This is termed the severe mercy of the Lord. That's what Romans 1 means when it says 
that God gave them over. A tourist to Israel noticed a shepherd carrying a lamb with a broken leg. He approached the shepherd to to inquire what had transpired. And to his surprise, the shepherd answered that he broke the leg of the lamb on purpose. The wayward sheep would not stay with the flock and thus kept putting itself in great danger. And so to avoid falling prey to other vicious animals, the shepherd in his love and and in trying to protect the lamb had no choice but to break the leg. It's the same way with God. Though Jonah tried to leave the Lord, the Lord never left Jonah. It is the patience of God that allows us to run away. It is the wisdom of God that provides the ship. It is the providence of God that sends the storm. It is the kindness of God that sends the great fish. If God did not care, he would let us go on and on in our sin forever. Jonah is swallowed by the whale, and during this time, he examines his life. In other words, Jonah was on lockdown inside the belly of this great fish. And as he examines his life in light of God's call, he prays the psalm and eventually repents. Through prayer, Jonah found a saving relationship with God. After three days in the belly of the whale, Jonah may have been a little worn. Jonah may have been a little smelly and even a different color. But he was now serviceable to God. And he goes off to Nineveh with the hope that no one will listen to his message. And that God will finally destroy. That God will finally level the city with his mighty wrath. But instead, the Bible says the whole town repents. The whole town comes forward singing. All to Jesus, I surrender. Jonah never could understand God's great love and forgiveness. God has a Nineveh for every one of us, a place we don't want to go, a command we don't want to obey. Going to Nineveh is unpopular. It will cost us something, perhaps our pride, perhaps our comfort, perhaps our complacency. It doesn't make sense. And it's hard. But God's purpose in dealing with us is to save others. We all have Ninevehs and and Tarshishes in our lives. Which one has the stronger pull in your life? Have you bought your ticket to Tarshish? Are you running from God like Jonah? Has God been calling you to perform or to do a specific task? To forsake the world and its pleasure? And to follow him with all of your heart. Has he been calling you to treat others with love and respect? Has he been calling you to forgive someone who hurt you? What is God calling you to do today? Our destiny is determined by choice and not by chance. Can we really run away from God? The psalmist in the book of Psalm 139 verses 7 to 12 says, Where can I go? From your spirit. We can, be in an, we can be in an environment or culture where God is not acknowledged, but God is never absent. We cannot escape the plan and will of God for our lives. If we try to, God will orchestrate events and circumstances in such a way that it will derail our plans in order that his plans take precedence. Even though Jonah ran from God, God was merciful enough to give him a second chance. How different Jonah's life could have been, how many troubles he could have avoided, simply by surrendering his plan to the will of God. How hard it was for him to pay the fare for leaving God. Jesus today, friends, wants to save each one. The ticket to Tashish may be cheap, It may be eye-catching, it may be convenient, but we will spend our entire lives paying for it because there are many hidden costs. No matter what you may have done in the past or doing now in the present, God is able and more than willing to forgive us. He is willing to give us a second chance. It could be that God is calling you to go to Nineveh. 
Nineveh stands for a clear revelation, a clear revelation of God's plan for your life. But instead you are in Tashish, the place we go to or the thing we do to avoid or to substitute the will of God. Where do you find yourself this morning? The same grace and love that God extended to Jonah, he extends to both you and I. I once heard a story about a young man who had to stand trial for a crime that he was accused of committing. His father, a wealthy man, was present for the court proceedings. After cross-examination and a jury's deliberation, the young man was found guilty as charged. His punishment was a prison sentence, which would take years to complete. As he was handcuffed to be led away to his prison cell, his father looked at his son one last time and said, I will never forgive you. You have brought disgrace upon this family. When you have done your time, when you have served your time in jail, please do not come back home. The young man at these words hung his head in shame and walked away. Years passed and the man, no, no, no longer young, had paid for his crime. With shaking hands and a heart full of dread over the response he might receive, he wrote to his dad, begging his forgiveness in the months before his release. In the letter he wrote, Daddy, I am almost ready to be released from prison. I will be on the train that will go right past your house. If you have forgiven me, please tie a white ribbon on the tree by the fence. If the white ribbon is not there, I will not get off the train. I will keep going and you will never see me again. The days passed and the newly released prisoner boarded the, the train. As the train neared his father's house, he couldn't bear to look out to see his father's response to his letter. And so he asked the man sitting across him if he would look for him. Tell me, he said, if there's a white ribbon in the tree by the fence. The other passenger stared out the window as the train passed by the house. The man held his breath, waiting to hear whether he had been accepted or rejected by his father. And so he asked, do you see a white ribbon by the tree? No, came the reply. The man's heart was broken. He had so hoped that time would have softened his father's heart toward him. No, the other passenger repeated. There isn't one white ribbon, but hundreds of white ribbons hanging from all the trees and all along the fence. What does it mean? asked the passenger. The young man, excited and filled with joy, jumped to his feet to collect his, uh, his bag. What does it mean? repeated the passenger. It means that my father has forgiven me and he is waiting to welcome me home. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our transgressions from us, when we come to Christ with repentant hearts, we can be assured of his love and forgiveness. Is it your heart's desire to commit your life to the plans of God? If it is, I invite you to pray with me. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your love and for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for this story of Jonah that reminds us that no matter what we may have done to offend you, that you are always willing to accept us and to extend to us your grace and mercy. And so we pray, dear God, that you would help us to accept your will and call in our lives. May you help us, Lord, to fulfill the plan and purpose that you have for each one. We pray, dear God, that you would forgive us for our mistakes, forgive us for our shortcomings, and as we place our feeble hands into your mighty hands, we pray the prayer of King David that you would create in us a clean heart and renew within us the, a right spirit. I pray, dear God, that you may watch over us and bless us and keep us faithful until we see you in the clouds of heaven is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. <music>